Thank you so much, everyone who's attending today. Um, this is um, the second of our talks on tick-borne pathogens. And today I'll be talking to you about Bunia viralis and how you can uh, search for data and analyze them in the bacterial and viral bioinformatics resource center. My name is Anna Maria Niewiedomska and I'm a bioinformatics analyst and um, uh, an outreach coordinator, Omar's counterpart at, um, or one of Omar's counterparts at the BVBRC. Uh, and I focus on viruses. Uh, so as I said, this is the second in our series. If this is your first time joining us, um, you can view uh, the previous talk that uh, Omar and Gloria gave on March 8th on ticks and how you can analyze them in the VU path uh, DB site. Um, and if you're interested in any of these other topics, which will be on bacteria, um, other viruses, and um, eukaryotic pathogens and ticks, please don't hesitate to sign up for those in the coming weeks. Um, so I thought today I'd get started with just a little introduction to what the BVBRC is, for those of you who might not already be familiar with it. Um, and then we would move on to a quick website uh, demo. And I have two viral use cases that um, I, I'm gonna use to kind of demonstrate some of the tools and the data uh, that you can find on the site. And one of them uh, involves comparative genomics and the other um, is a you know pretend case on let's say viral isolation and characterization um, from a metagenomic sample. And then we can have some time left over for uh, questions and discussion. Uh, so you're probably already quite familiar with uh, VU Path DB site, which combines information on eukaryotic pathogens and vectors. And that site uh, is obviously a VU Path DB where you signed up for this webinar. Uh, but you might be less familiar with the BVBRC site, which actually just launched um, a couple months ago. And this site combines uh, bioinformatic information and tools on uh, from two sites, uh, Patrick, which focuses on bacterial pathogens, and um, IRD and Viper, which focus on viral pathogens. And we've launched a new site combining our resources and tools into the bvbrc.org. Um, and we are holding an introductory webinar series on our site uh, because it's quite new and the interface is quite new. Uh, and you can find a lot of these uh, <clears throat> introductory webinars already online on our YouTube channel. You just search for BVBRC uh, DB and you'll find it. Uh, and if you want, um, I'm giving another webinar on Friday on how to find and search for data sets on the site, or you can sign up for um, the next one on tools and services uh, on Friday, April 1st. Um, so as I said, we have uh, information on our site for both uh, bacteria, which uh, obviously are um, really well known to be transmitted um, by ticks, including things like Lyme disease and rickettsial diseases. Um, and we have uh, a few different um, bacterial genera that are tick-borne, and my colleague Rebecca will be talking about some of these in the upcoming sessions. Uh, but my focus is on viruses, so I'm here to talk about the viral families. Um, <clears throat> and from the ones that we focus on on the site, uh, these four are uh, the major tick-borne pathogens. And today's session, um, I'll be focusing on Bunia viralis and um, I think maybe the last session in the series, I'll uh, use uh, Flavi Veridae for my use cases. So just a quick introduction to the Bunia viralis order. Um, it's quite a large order of viruses and it encompasses uh, a lot of viral families, but uh, ICTV, the International Committee on Viral Taxonomy, um, decided to combine these under one order because um, they're related and um, <clears throat> have a lot of functional similarities. Um, but not all of them are transmitted to humans, so you might not have heard of all of these. 
The ones in black are particularly relevant to humans and cause disease in them. And the ones with an asterisk next to them, um, these four families uh, have major species in them that are tick-borne pathogens. And for today's purposes, I'll be focusing on the Nairoviridae family. And Nairoviruses um, <clears throat> include uh, several different species some of them more famous than others, but uh, the one I think with the most research on it so far is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, orthonirovirus, which is what um, I'll be using today for my uh, demo. Um, but the ones in black are uh, well known to be transmitted um, to humans in bolt, sorry. Um, so just quickly, what are the viral characteristics? Because it's important to understand um, the basic virology of what you're looking at. So if you don't already know, um, they are negative single-stranded um, viruses, but they're a little bit different from your average virus because they're segmented, meaning that their genome comes in three different parts. Um, the S, M and L, which stand for small, medium, and large. And um, if you want to find out more about them, uh, you can find out more on ICTV and um, Viral Zone, which have great resources for um, understanding the basic virology of these um, of this family. Uh, so. The large segment codes for all of the enzymes, the, the protease, the polymerase, the helicase, and the ribonuclease. And um, the GPC is uh, the external, uh, whoops, it codes for um, two proteins, the GC and the GN proteins, which uh, form the spikes on the outside of uh, the virion. Uh, the N protein, which is encoded by uh, the small segment, uh, codes for the nucleoprotein, which coats the um, RNA segments inside the capsid. So uh, this is just a quick look at uh, the phylogeny of the family. And um, we've got Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever on this branch over here. And you can see that um, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of diversity in terms of the animals that um, these viruses infect, as well as uh, the types of um, ticks that transmit them. So uh, for those of you interested in host virus interactions, that's something important to pay attention to. So for today's purposes, um, <clears throat> I thought I would try and uh, focus on two use cases. And one of them is um, looking at a point mutation in a data set of Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, and um, which is shown to have functional relevance. So we're going to search and assemble uh, a data set. We're gonna create a multiple sequence alignment, and we're gonna use a tool called uh, Metacats to uh, see whether there's any other um, uh, sites that are specific to um, the, the hosts. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, as we go along. Uh, and for the next use case, we're going to um, pretend that we have a metagenomic sample um, with an unknown virus in it, but that has um, symptoms of a hemorrhagic fever virus, like a nirovirus. So we're going to use a couple of different tools to try and um, extract the genome from, uh, to characterize uh, what's in our next-gen sequencing sample, uh, extract it from the next-gen sequencing sample, assemble it, and then um, characterize it through BLAST and then annotate, annotate the viral sequence. So one of the things that, um, <clears throat> came up in recent research on the Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus was that um, this paper came out, I think in 2020, before all the virus, all the virology focus moved on to SARS-CoV-2 um, or maybe after. And uh, they found that 
there's a single amino acid change uh, that can affect um, how well this virus can infect human cells versus tick cells. Um, and that change was um, in the GC protein, which is part of the, um, the, the medium, the M viral segment. And that's a change from an R um, to a G. So I thought it would be interesting to try and put together a data set on, um, on this protein and see what we can find in our database and look at whether any of the other ones um, other than this MT1303 had this change in it. And then whether we could find any other mutations that um, might be specific to um, viruses that were isolated in ticks versus viruses that were isolated in humans. So I'm gonna move on to the site now. And check if there's any questions in the meantime. All right, looks like we're good. Okay, so this is uh, the BVBRC site, uh, and you can get to it just by navigating to uh, bvbrc.org. And um, you don't have to be logged in to use the site, but uh, if you do log in uh, over here, you can have a chance to save your data sets and uh, save the analysis of your tools, which um, if you do want to use the tools, you uh, do have to create an account. And if you're a previous user of Patrick or IRD and Viper, uh, you don't need to create a new account. You can just use your previous login credentials to sign in. Um, so since we're talking about viruses today, I'm going to go ahead and just click on viruses. And this takes me to the viral overview page. And here we have a quick summary of the viral families uh, posited by um, the Baltimore classification scheme, single-stranded positive sense RNA viruses, single-stranded negative sense RNA viruses, and so on and so forth. Um, if you are a viral taxonomist and you want to find your virus um, by going through the taxonomy tree, you can just switch uh, tabs and um, navigate to your virus of interest through there. But because most of us are not taxonomists, we probably um, will go ahead and skip that. The other thing you can do is um, just search for the virus that you're interested in over here in our um, search box. So you would just put uh, Crimean, uh, Congo hemorrhagic fever, and uh, specify a data type if you like, or you can, um, or you can just specify um, all data types and see what's in the system if you want to browse it. But because I'm a vis visual person, um, I'm going to click on the pic pretty picture of Bunia viralis. And that takes me to uh, the overview page for the Bunia viralis order. And again, we have a few different tabs over here, which shows um, the different types of data that you can find in the site, uh, which includes the taxonomy, uh, the viral strains. And um, what's nice about the strain view is that um, <clears throat> it doesn't show you just the individual uh, viral segment, because remember, these viruses are segmented and have um, three genomic segments, the small, medium, and large. But it shows you um, what's available for each strain and shows you the accession number um, for each one. So for some of them, you can see that there's only one segment available, um, but there's full genome segments uh, with all three segments available for some others. Um, and if you click on the genome view, this shows you um, a list of the individual segments. And if you click on the protein view, um, that will uh, show you the proteins. Protein structures obviously shows you um, the 3D protein structures. Uh, the domains and motifs tab will give you a summary of the um, what's available in terms of um, 
domains characterized by interproscan, and these could be structural or functional domains. Um, and then uh, there's also epitope data that is um, imported from um, the immune epitope database if you're interested in um, immunology. So I'm gonna go back to uh, the overview page and because I'm only interested in Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, um, I'm going to uh, navigate to the Nairoviridae family and uh, go to orthoniroviruses and specifically click on uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever orthoniroviruses only. And from here, if you want to drill down to just these, because remember for now, um, these tabs show you um, data for everything in the Bunya viralis family, you have to go to this green action bar and uh, click on uh, one of these buttons. If you click on the taxon overview, it will show you all of the data that's associated with that particular taxon. If you just want um, the genomic, uh, that is to say the, the nucleic acid segments, you can just click on genomes. If you're only interested in the proteins, you can click on um, the features or proteins tab to get to there. So I'm going to click on um, the taxon overview and you'll see that um, it's changed the breadcrumbs up here from Bunya viralis to uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever with a virus. So now it's showing me um, only information uh, relating to uh, Crimean Congo um, virus. And we have about um, 4,000 uh, of those viruses in the database. So the plan was to um, find uh, proteins for the glycoprotein complex, um, precursor uh, complex, and to look at whether that there was that specific mutation in, um, <clears throat> in that virus in that one um, region of the protein. So I'm gonna switch to the genomes tab and this will give me a list of everything that's there, but I'm not interested in all of the viral segments. So I'm gonna need to uh, drill down to just the segments that I'm interested in. So I'm gonna click on the filters tab, um, click on uh, true to make sure I'm only looking at um, what's available in uh, the public database, um, others, other uh, genomes that um, are false are genomes that I've uploaded myself. So you probably won't see this when you, uh, if you're a new user. Um, I only want uh, complete segments, so not short fragments. So I'm gonna click on complete. And that takes me down to about 491 results. And again, I'm only interested in uh, the medium segment of the virus. So I'm going to click on that. And then there's a few other um, <clears throat> things that you can use to uh, focus your results. So given that I'm only interested in um, those viruses that were isolated either from humans or ticks, I'm, I'm going to click on uh, human and tick to further focus my results. Uh, and you can click on this gear button to look at uh, a few other uh, metadata fields that you can use to um, drill down and select data that's relevant to you if you want to. And then um, the important thing to remember is that you need to hit apply so that this applies your filters to uh, the other tabs in, uh, on the page. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on apply and that will um, give me these 142 uh, genomic segments. And now when I move to the protein tab, it's only going to show me uh, proteins that are uh, annotated from these, um, I mean, uh, from these nucleic acid segments. Um, and if you want to customize um, your view of the data, you can click on this tiny, little uh, black plus sign. And this will help you um, <clears throat> look at all of the different metadata that's available for uh, these sequences. Now, some of them might not apply to this particular viral family, 
Um, but for example, if you wanted to see um, information on the host, um, you, and you can click on um, host group or host name. And um, we put actually a lot of time into curating um, the host names so that um, it's easily understandable and you can um, understand that Hyaloma Asiaticum is actually just a tick. Um, and we've put these into uh, host groups so that you can also search um, just by looking at a general group or something like mosquitoes or uh, humans or non-human mammals. So <clears throat> moving on, I will click on proteins and this should take me to a page where I can look at um, the protein information or um, other features that are associated with those uh, genomic segments that I specifically filtered. And um, so we have our viral uh, genome name, the accession number, uh, the feature type, which is the coding sequence, um, the beginning and the end of the annotation. It tells us on what strand it is, um, the length of the protein, the gene simple, which in this case is the uh, glycoprotein precursor complex um, and the protein product name. So we're gonna take all of these select them. And then uh, you'll notice that the options that are here in the green uh, action bar change. So you can do a few different things. You can download the data. Um, you can copy it to a clipboard. Uh, you can uh, switch to a feature list view or the genome list view. You can uh, grab uh, the data um, in FASTA format. You can uh, directly create a multiple sequence alignment. Um, for this, but um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you do it with 147 results because that can take a little while. But um, to give you a quick example, let's say if you did it with uh, four and you click on multiple sequence analysis uh, button, you can make um, an MSA either from the nucleotides or the amino acids um, um, uh, sequence. And this opens up uh, a new window and um, will give you just a quick idea of uh, what, what you're looking at. And, um, but again, this can take a little bit more time with uh, a large data set. So I prefer to select them all and group them together and you can save them as uh, a feature group. And so there's a couple of different ways to save um, genomic uh, data sets in, um, <clears throat> in the BVBRC. And the genome groups create groups based on the nucleic acid sequence. And the feature groups uh, will be what you use to create groups based on the amino acid sequence. So I'm going to make sure a feature is selected. You click on uh, new group, and then um, you uh, can select which folder you'd like to put it in. And I already have a folder for um, this tutorial. So I'm going to select that. And then you can just give it um, any group name that you want. For example, um, let's see. Uh, there we go or we call it, maybe GPC is better. And you click add. So um, this will tell you, there'll be a little black box that pops up and tells you that your um, working set has been created, but now where do you go to find it? Uh, you can go to the tab under workspaces and go to your home. And uh, you have a few default uh, folders in there. And those include your feature groups and genome groups and your experiments folder. Uh, but again, I saved it to the tick tutorial folder. So that's where I would go to find it. Um, and this is all my data. You can uh, sort by size, by um, when it was created, and you can find it. So I wanted to 
make a multiple sequence alignment and see if I could find that one mutation that was mentioned in that publication. Uh, so what I'm going to do is go to tools and services and click on uh, MSA, multiple sequence alignment and SNP analysis. Um, <clears throat> and over here, I have uh, the option of starting with a couple of different things. Uh, you can start with unaligned sequence if you're starting um, with uh, multiple sequence alignment from scratch. Or if you're just interested in looking at SNP variation um, and you've made your multiple sequence analysis, let's say in another um, type of software, uh, you can just upload that as an aligned sequences. But mine are unaligned and um, they actually exist in feature group, um, which I saved. So I'm going to um, look for that over here in my folder. And I've got my 147 uh, features and I'm going to select OK. I make sure that um, it's set to uh, the right option, which is protein, not DNA. You also have the option of uploading your own data file from your desktop or just copying and pasting some sequences here if you want to. We have a couple of different aligners, um, including MAFT and muscle. I'm going to just leave it on MAFT because it's um, a little bit faster. And we can specify again our output folder and um, our output name. <clears throat> and then that should make the submit button um, show up because it doesn't show up. It's grayed out unless you have all of the information uh, in there. And then you can just go ahead and click on submit. And if you get a green box telling you that um, everything worked out, uh, then you're good. But then what do I do? Uh, this is a little bit different than uh, the Viper and IRD sites, which I previously used. Uh, so you have to find uh, your job now. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. One is by going to the workspace tab and clicking on my jobs, or um, if, you, if you've been paying um, attention, there's this little box down here, uh, which shows you uh, the status of any uploads that you've done or uh, the status of your jobs. So um, it just finished running and it's completed. So I can click on that. And that takes me to uh, my job status page. And I can see uh, over here the status um, of my jobs. So you can see I have some of them that have completed, some that failed. And if it's still running, it'll be in yellow and say running. Every job gets a job ID. And this is important because if a job fails and um, you'd like to send us a complaint, it's useful to send us the job ID so that we can look into why. Um, it shows you the service, your output name that you gave it, um, and information on when you submitted it, when you started, and when it completed. So you can just go ahead and click on that. And you'll find a list of um, output files. Now, you might not understand what um, each of these file extensions are. Um, and there's a lot of information on the documentation that you can read through. Or if you're already familiar with these, you probably already know what some of them are. But if you're just um, like me, impatient and just want to see your multiple sequence alignment, you can uh, click on this little eye icon up here. And um, that will usually, you can usually look in the top right corner um, for a button that will help you um, look at the main results of your output. So this will give you a nice multiple sequence alignment um, <clears throat> with a nice color scheme that you can kind of scroll through. And um, we can look for our um, relevant amino acids over here. So in terms of the ID type, we have our own internal IDs for the genomes, but obviously we realize that these are not going to um, be meaningful to you. So you can set your own ID type. You can change it to the genome name. Um, you can change it to um, the GenBank accession number if you're like looking at your data that way. 
um, or you can change it to uh, the host uh, information on the host because that's what we're interested in. So we can see which one of these um, genomes are coming from humans and which one of them are coming from ticks. And so if you remember in uh, the publication that we looked at, um, this position was um, a G, an R that changes to a G. So I'm already familiar with this segment. Uh, so I'm gonna go to uh, that section of the alignment and we can find um, what we're looking for. Oops, overshot a little bit. All right, so let's see. I believe um, that the that the residue we're looking at is this R residue over here in blue, and you can see that it's quite conserved in almost all of the genomes that we look at, um, with the exception of this one gene, um, this one genome over here where it's changed to a G. And that's actually the one um, that was published on in the paper. And you can scroll through the entire results um, to look for uh, whether you can find any other sequences that also have this mutation um, or whether it's conserved everywhere else. Uh, or you can go back to um, the workspace. And if you want to get the, the readout as, um, um, table, you can click on uh, the snip.tsv file and view that. And that um, gives you an output table where you can look at the individual positions um, and get a detailed view of how many sequences have what residue at which position. So um, you can download that yourself and parse it yourself, or you can uh, just visualize it over here or um, search for the specific residue, which I think was um, 1134 and search for that um, as well. And that will tell you that um, the majority of them are um, uh, contain the, the glycine. All right. so. Going back uh, to my jobs page, um, what was the other thing that we wanted to do? So it was this was a little bit disappointing because I didn't find any other um, genomes that have this mutation in them. So um, there's another tool that we use called uh, Metacats. And what this tool does is it looks for any positions that have a significant difference um, between specific groups of um, input data. For example, if you want to look at um, whether genomes for a specific virus have evolved um, over, over the years, you might say, you might put together a group of genomes from 20 years ago and a group of genomes from, um, you know, the past five years and look at whether there are any sites that have significantly changed. Um, and in this, that way, you and in the same, um, using the same method, you can also look at whether viruses that have been isolated from ticks have any sites that are significantly different uh, than viruses that have been isolated from humans. Um, all you need to do is um, put together a genome group or a feature group, um, as I showed you before, and um, upload that into this uh, uh, this tool called Metacats, and you can find that under Tools and Services under uh, the Genomics Tools. And you can either let uh, us do auto grouping, or you can select your own feature groups, which is what I did. And what I what I did is basically um, collected all of the GPC proteins that. Uh, had in the metadata that, that they were isolated from humans and all of the ones that were isolated from ticks. And I made separate groups for those. And um, my plan is to upload these and look at whether there's any significant differences between them. 
So again, I have to specify my output folder, uh, my output name, and um, you can either, as I said, let the, the tool do the auto grouping for you um, based on um, whatever metadata that you want, including the host name, uh, the geographic location or country, the species or genus of the virus, or even the collection year. Uh, but in this case, just to kind of speed things along, as I said, I've created two working groups, one isolated from humans um, and one isolated from uh, ticks. And so I can go into my folder and um, these are the ones isolated from humans. So I'm gonna select those. And then you press the plus button to uh, put it into your groups table. And then select the one, uh, the, the feature group from ticks and add that. And you can just go ahead and click on submit. But uh, for the sake of time, I've already kind of completed that. And um, <clears throat> I have my results already over here. And to view those, you can just again click on this uh, button and it loads uh, all of the results for you in this table. And uh, it gives you the individual position of the protein, uh, the chi-square and p-value, kind of showing uh, uh, significance of the, the statistical significance of the position. Uh, it gives you just a quick uh, no or yes based on uh, the p-value that you specified, which I think was 0.05, which is the default. Um, <clears throat> it tells you whether or not there's fewer um, than, than five uh, positions or sequences at that particular uh, position. And then it gives you um, information on uh, what residue can be found in the tick uh, genomes and what residue can be found in uh, the human genomes. Or actually, I think it's uh, the other way around. This one is the tick, and this one is the human. So uh, if I'm only interested in uh, the significant values, I can go ahead and go to uh, significant and type Y for yes, and click on filter. And this shows me uh, <clears throat> that there's quite a few uh, significant results where there's um, a statistically significant difference between uh, the residues that are found in viruses isolated from ticks and viruses that are isolated uh, from humans. <clears throat> and um, you know this, this can really help you um, if you're doing mutational experiments to pick uh, some interesting uh, spots to mutate and, um, and to go ahead with uh, experimental uh, design for them. So, uh, so because we're getting into a bit of a time crunch, um, I'm going to move on to the second use case, uh, which is to pretend I have uh, <clears throat> a, a metagenomic sample um, from, from a patient with uh, hemorrhagic fever or symptoms of hemorrhagic fever, and we've kind of sequence that and now we want to figure out what's in there. Does this person actually have um, some kind of nirovirus? So to do that, um, <clears throat> I'm going to go to um, tools and services and under the metagenomics section, I'm going to click on taxonomic classification. And what this tool does is basically uh, gives you a quick bird's eye view of what the different taxa are in your metagenomic sample um, <clears throat> and uh, what, um, what you can look for in terms of uh, what you can expect to find if you uh, do de novo assembly for the sample. Uh, so I don't actually have my own uh, file because I don't work on, um, on these viruses. But I do have uh, an SRA, um, an SRA number, which um, I'm just going to pull up real quick, and that is, let's see, 
and just copy and paste that from here. And again, you can um, input uh, your files in multiple different ways, either from a paired read library, a single read library, or you can just analyze uh, things that are already in SRA if you want to practice. And that's what I'm doing over here. So you just click on the arrow button to load it into your selected libraries. Um, and you can uh, choose the algorithm, uh, choose the specific database that you'd like to look at. Um, and in this case, it's just looking at all genomes. You can choose whether or not you want to uh, save your classified sequences uh, or the unclassified sequences. Uh, you can again specify your output folder and your output name. Um, and just go ahead and click submit. And again, for the purposes of time, I've already done this uh, taxonomic classification. So I'm going to just show you what uh, the results look like. And again, you just click on this uh, view button to look at your report. And this gives you a nice table of uh, what's in there and uh, as well as how many reads um, and what percent coverage and um, where in the taxonomy they are. So you can see that you know there's obviously a lot of bacteria in this sample, um, some eukaryotic <clears throat> um, genomes as well. And uh, in terms of the viruses, we do have a norovirus, which in this case is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. And again, if you're a visual person um, like me, I really like uh, this chart which gives you um, this nice pie chart of um, what percentage of reads belong to what group. So in this case, we have about 24% that are no hits, quite a lot that belong to bacteria. And this is pretty typical in uh, metagenomic samples and just a tiny bit that, um, a fraction of it that are viral. And you can click on that to kind of expand it um, and look at exactly what's there. And in this case, the majority of the viruses are uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, as we said. So now that you know uh, that you have uh, probably this virus or um, a Bunyo-like virus in your uh, sample, you'd say, okay, well, now I wanna assemble those reads, or I wanna do a little bit of QC on these reads. So you can, Again, use another tool in our toolbox, which is uh, the FastQ Utilities. Um, and this has a couple of different uh, services. In addition to uh, what you probably already know that it's used for uh, quality control of FastQ reads, um, you can choose um, FastQC, which will just give you an idea of how good your sample is and um, whether your reads are worth assembling or aligning and click on plus for that service. But if you also want to extract um, out that fraction of the viral sequences uh, from it, you can also use the align service, click plus, and then uh, tell it what your target genome is, which in this case was Crimean um, Congo hemorrhagic fever. And oops, and wait for that to uh, load and choose what you want your um, reference genome to be, which in this case, um, I'm going to choose the reference genome. Um, again, just specify your output folder and output name. Um, And then uh, you can give it uh, the run uh, number that you uploaded previously, or you can put in your own reads as well. And just click the arrow button to add it to your selected libraries. And again, you can combine multiple libraries um, if you have uh, multiple sequences, uh, multiple run runs for the same sample and click on submit. So, to just give you an idea of 
um, what that job looks like. Um, again, I've pre-computed this uh, analysis. So <clears throat> this is what uh, your output files look like. You've got um, your aligned fast queues. You've got uh, some BAM files. And um, you also have uh, the fast QC report. So if you go ahead and click on that, uh, it gives you, uh, if you're already familiar with FastQC, it gives you the basic statistics that you're probably already familiar with in terms of your sequence quality, um, GC content, and things like that. So this is, this is a pretty decent um, sample, although obviously um, adapters are still there um, and there's still uh, some sequence duplication. But overall, it's, it's not bad. So um, if you go back, uh, though, and uh, you want to look at how many of them align to your uh, Crimean Congo uh, reference genome, you can click on the align option. And this will show you um, how many, what percentage of your reads in that sample align to it. And this is quite low, but that's pretty expected for um, viral sequences because they're just such a small fraction of the reads. And so you can find them uh, over here. Uh, and this will give you a few more uh, statistics. And I encourage you to read the documentation for this tool because um, there's a lot of details in here that are uh, important to understand. But uh, for the sake of time today, I'm going to move on to um, the next service, which is now that um, we have these um, aligned uh, sequences. What are what are we going to do with them? So you can download this file um, and then go to uh, the assembly tool and upload those uh, into into here. And so since I already have those uploaded, uh, again just for the sake of time. I'm going to put that over here because it was from a single read library and click on the arrow button to add it to the selected libraries. Um, again, set up my output folder um, and you have a couple of different options. Um, if you are picky about uh, your assembly strategy, if you don't want to worry about it, you can just leave the auto option and um, let the pipeline figure it out. Again, just give your output a name and click on assemble. And it's it's pretty quick, but um, again, for the sake of time, I've already done that. Uh, and you can go to uh, the job results and <clears throat> download um, your FASTA file, which will contain your uh, assembled contigs. Uh, if you wanna look at the assembly report, you can click on that and use the I button to view it in the browser. Um, and again, it's not, it's not uh, too impressive because again, viral sequences are usually only a small fraction of metagenomic samples, but we've got two decent um, contigs, which you can see in the bandage plots over here. And um, when you download them, uh, you, can, you can take a look at what they are. But, uh, you know, and this will, again, just give you a few more statistics on, um, <clears throat> on uh, what's there. So, and then uh, there's a quality assessment uh, report that you can look at uh, as well. But now that you have uh, your contigs, you might want to find out what they are. And you can do that, um, you can characterize those with a couple of different methods. Um, in my case, I'm going to um, just take my downloaded um, contigs, assembled contigs, um, and I've got those in a file over here, ready to go. And again, there were there were two uh, different contigs, so I'm going to grab one of them, which is the larger one, and uh, just paste it into here. And again, you have a few different um, 
blast algorithms that you can use, but I'm going to keep it simple and just choose blast in nucleotides against nucleotides. Uh, and there's a couple of different uh, ways you can search. Uh, we have some pre-compiled databases where you can just search against um, representative genomes for either bacteria or viruses. Or if you want to search within a specific group that you've already put together, um, you can do that. And I already have a saved group of these um, viral genomes. So I'm going to click on search within a selected genome group, um, make sure that uh, the database type is correct and select my genome group over here, uh, which in this case is, whoops, Uh, which is in this case is, uh, hang on, so it's my folder, find it, which in this case is all of the nirovirus um, complete M segments. And if this was an unknown virus, this would be quite useful because this would help me figure out um, if I hadn't used the taxonomic classifier, what I have. So I'm gonna click on that. Um, give it an output name and click on submit. And again, I already have this completed and that's um, the, the BLAST service is called homology and the results can be viewed again by clicking on the I and this shows you um, your results. And as expected, you know, as we saw in the taxonomic classifier, uh, this is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, and it shows us um, uh, which one of these is uh, most similar to which genome. And in this case, it's almost exactly, uh, it's exactly uh, similar to the reference genome, which is the NC5300. Uh, um, but let's say it was an unknown virus, um, and I'd like to annotate it. Uh, I can do that by going to our um, annotation service and I can again upload uh, my contigs over here. And if you if I haven't already shown you how to do that, you can just click on um, upload and you can drag and drop or select your file uh, over here. And I think I already have this uh, labeled as step two E for annotation. Click on OK. You select the viral, the, the recipe that you want, which in this case is um, bacteria, viruses, or bacteriophages. And um, this will be annotated using the Vigor 4 program. Um, you can select what level of taxonomy you think it is, um, or you. Um, <clears throat> And in this case, uh, let's say it's an unknown nirovirus. So I can just click on the Nyroviridae family. And this fills out the taxonomy for me over here. Um, I can just give it whatever name I want, annotation, and specify my output folder, which is that, and go ahead and click on annotate. And again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to go ahead to my pre-computed results and find um, the annotation job. So this gives me, again, um, a large list of files. And again, you don't, know how, you don't have to know every single one. Um, you can just click on the, the View button to look at your annotated genome. Uh, you can just click on uh, view CDS to click to see the, um, a list of the coding sequences. Um, and in this case, uh, both of the both of the two contigs that were assembled uh, turned out to be part of the GPC uh, glycoprotein complex, but um, slightly smaller, uh, slightly different sized fragments of it. So, that's it. Um, and since I'm close to the hour, I'll leave some time for uh, questions. And 
open it up for questions. And if you want to find out more, you can um, again search YouTube for uh, BVBRC. Uh, and you can find a lot of instructional videos on how to use the site and the tool. And um, you can uh, also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or go to um, our subreddit to just ask general questions. Hey, Anna. Yes. This is Maulik. Can you hey. go to the jobs list and just show how to report a failed job uh, in case people kind of uh, get stuck somewhere or if they uh, have any problem? Sure. Um, so this happens to me often, um, especially um, I should mention as the site is still in beta. Um, so we, we obviously don't expect everything to be perfect and you will encounter bugs. Um, some of them might be our fault and some of them uh, might be just because something um, something might have gone wrong in um, you know what you've input and you can do that by just clicking on uh, the job and clicking on uh, report issue and that will open up uh, a box with the job number um, you know and all of the relevant information uh, with what you input. Uh, you can also uh, attach uh, any of your input data that you want and click on submit to um, tell us about a job that failed and you think shouldn't have failed. And that helps us uh, figure out all of the bugs in the system. Um, if also, you, also you can also add some text in there too, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> And if you um, just have general questions, um, if there's a particular tool or service that you want and you're not quite sure how to do it, um, but you think that we might be able to help with, you can just go to um, our help tab and click on contact us and just tell us, hey, you know, I want to do uh, this with this virus or this bacterial sample. Um, how can I do it? Um, and we'll try and get back to you and help you with that. Um, and if you look under the help tab, you can also find a lot of uh, really useful resources, um, including a quick start to just get you uh, oriented in the website, um, quick references for the tools. We also have some tutorials for the common um, tasks that you might wanna complete on the website. Um, if you're interested in um, large data sets, uh, downloading them, uploading them, um, batch uh, services, you can use our um, command line interface and there's a tutorial for that. Uh, we also have a link for any webinars that we're going to be uh, um, uh, having in the future, uh, instructional videos and uh, workshops. Anna, you have another question in the chat. Okay. Um, is there a certificate for this webinar? Um, I'm not sure. Are we doing certificates for this webinar series? Omar? No, we, um, we were not. Oh, Omar is, is gone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so no, we were not thinking of, of having certificates. Okay. Does the BVBRC have SRA data? Um, we don't have SRA data, um, as far as I know, because that that is, you know, usually involves a lot of um, space. But we do accept it um, in multiple of our services. All right. So uh, I mean, maybe Anna, I can expand on that. So SRA is a mix back of the genomic RNA seq and the metagenomic data. Uh, I think yeah. the assembled genomes that are available in GenBank, they are all integrated in BBBRC and you can access them. In addition to that, if you, there is a special, uh, like you no know, data set that you are interested in, as Anna showed during the webinar, you can import it in your workspace yeah. using various analysis tools for RNA-seq metagenomic or the genome assembly, and then uh, analyze what on your own. Right. 
all of our tools except um, just the SRA run numbers as inputs. Um, it seems somebody needs a translator. Uh, I can try. <laughs> I can use Google Translate. <laughs> <laughs> Hola, Roberto. ¿Tienes alguna pregunta? No, por ahora. Era solo para saber si, si había algún traductor. Gracias por la invitación. Ok. Ana, he, he just wanted to... <laughs> Just want to do un ask. poco de español, pero no sé cómo okay, hablar bien. <laughs> ah, perfecto, perfecto. Y tenemos, obviamente, personas de alrededor del mundo. Así que, si hablas una lengua diferente, creo que cubrimos un par de lenguas, la mayoría de the Uh, United Nations uh, languages that we have. We've got Spanish, Arabic, French, English, Chinese. <laughs> so we're happy to help uh, people from around the world as well. Thank you, Anna. All right. Well, if there are no more questions. Um, this recording uh, will be up on YouTube uh, within the next day or so. I'll also put up um, a detailed tutorial of the use cases I ran through and my slides. So um, you can go through it at a slower pace because obviously I just kind of rushed through things a little bit. Um, and again, if you have any other questions, uh, please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, and if you're interested in any of our other uh, series, you can go to uh, vupathdb.org and sign up for them. I know uh, Rebecca, my colleague, in a couple of weeks is going to be talking about um, tick endosymbionts and then on April 19th, metagenomic analysis of tick samples, which is going to be pretty interesting. So thank you again and have a great day.